riding when you do hills is you're in a rhythm, you've been riding 20 miles, you're going, and then you hit a hill. And like, Ooh, kill and then you gain your rhythm. This is like killer. Downhill, killer, downhill, kill, you know, and so yeah. it's like there's no there's a sense of cheeriness. A friend of mine, uh, John Cullen, uh, we were going to have a team meeting to move to the Santa Barbara from New York, but he, um, he, 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 he,
Walking outside, and I was like, Is that Bob? Is he coming inside? Is he leaving? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was wondering. How's it going? Yeah, I was there. Uh, how's everything? Can I get you some coffee or anything? No. Oh, nice. Yeah, I saw that. Pancakes. The problem with those pancakes in Elmer's is that, well, I always want to go to sleep afterwards. <laughs> Good. How's the rest of the evening? Comfortable? Um, I just feel a little bit weird, like I have a back thing, like we're sitting in that chair yesterday all day and then performing, I feel, well, I think, huh? No, it's okay. A, a big switch from sitting to then flying around. <laughs>
two more minutes as a group to come up with some insights.
of art, but is the art is in and of itself uh, the process with non-artists in many cases. Um, later on, we'll take a break at the end of this, and then we're going to, I just wrote work session because I wanted to do some form of work with this great group, not quite knowing what we would do. Um, but I was talking to Polly this morning, and, and we had talked before about sharing some of the ideas that's coming out, that are coming out of Power Round, specifically related to the Culture Coin Project 
which really brings us to, into the entry the, the, through the doorway of resources and value, which we were also talking about yesterday. So I'm excited about that. We'll see where that goes and, and what happens from there. Um, people should feel free to get more coffee and yogurt or whatever they need, and also feel free to come in and sit wherever there's an empty chair uh, and make yourself comfortable. Um, so I'll pass it over to you, Michael. Yes. Why don't you get some seats over here? Like, I haven't seen yes. that people who wanted to sit down. Yeah. yeah, so please come in. Because when Michael starts talking, I mean, you're going to want to get comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot to say something. Forgive me. Let me just say one more thing while people are coming in. Um, is that, again, we are web streaming this on New Play TV. We have many people watching. I want to thank those who are, who are participating via the internet. Uh, Michael, if it's possible, Milena might raise a hand at some point, and when we get into discussion mode, there could be people with, with comments or questions uh, online. It's great to include them. Um, yes? Thanks, man. Hey, I, I feel like we should start this morning, though, um, Matt is probably not going to do it, but just by uh, appreciating and thanking Double H for that beautiful show we saw last night. Yeah. happen, then we get the joy of, of you know, watching them make this other thing happen, and just to acknowledge all the support that they're giving us to be here, while also simultaneously making this beautiful piece of art that we got to enjoy. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm Michael, and we're going we're gonna to do intros, but basically we were asked, and this came out of some conversations that Holly had, had with Matthew and I had, had with Matthew. Um, about this notion of cross-sector, which seems to play into the vocabulary and translation and kind of cross-field issue. So we're going to get going with a, a fairly kind of planned out couple hours, which is not really going to be about us talking at you. We're actually going to spend a good part of this time splitting into groups and just talking about the, some issues around this work, because we were certainly feeling um, uh, yesterday, uh, with this sort of amazing assemblage of people, we sure would like to have a chance to be in conversation with each other uh, a bunch. So we're going to make some space for that this morning. Um, we did have a question at the beginning. Uh, one of the ways that we have sort of described this notion of cross-sector is when artists work with people or organizations or institutions that do not self-define as art-centered. Yeah? So we're just wondering how many people in here consider themselves folks who, at times, do cross-sector work with that definition. Just curious. Say the definition again? Yeah, people who do work, uh, who as artists, Marty said she will do this a lot, <laughs> folks who consider themselves artists, who work with individuals, or organizations, or institutions oh. that do not self-define as oh, art-centered. Okay. okay, I do. See? I think a lot of you do that. Okay, and how about sort of this notion of cross-sector being um, uh, more about the translation that happens when you work across disciplines within the arts? Yeah, or when you, yeah, I already saw hands shooting up, so just wondering about that. Great, so we, we have no sort of definitive, wow, this is what it must mean, but we have sort of the experiences that we come from and the work that is interesting to us. So that said, the way we're going to proceed is each of the six folks up here, including Polly and I, are going to take three minutes to give an introduction of our own work uh, and ideas that feels relevant to today's conversation, and Polly will time. Uh, uh, following that three minutes, each person is going to have one minute where someone out here can ask a question, and this person has under a minute to respond to that question, and then we go on to the next person. So basically, this will be somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes of that. And then Polly and I are going to do a, a really brief, all of us are going to do a really brief summary of the dinner conversation we had last night, where we tried to sort of get into it in prep. And we felt like, wow, that was really, we had a great conversation. <laughs> so we don't want to reiterate that conversation. We want to share a couple of the themes that seem important. Uh, and then we're going to offer a suggested prompt, break into small groups. We will each join a group, not as a leader, but as a participant. 
and then those groups are going to have around 20 minutes to talk. Out of those 20 minutes, each group is going to share something specific back, and then we're just going to open up to a big room conversation. So that's our goal for this morning. That's our structure. So um, to st I see nobody sort of like going, no! So hopefully that's <laughs> not Internal. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or is that your, is that important? Okay, good. <laughs> Dr. Janess is okay with that. Okay. Uh, and those of you watching at home, uh, there will be various points for intersection between the virtual and the live throughout that process. Welcome. So I'm just going to start by... Going this I know way. It. So Aaron's gonna have three minutes. Um, I'm not even sort of doing the name thing. I just feel super lucky to be in conversation with everyone here and with these great sort of wonderful colleagues. So it's really nice. Aaron Landsman, your three minutes begin now. Go on. Okay. Go. Uh, for those of you maybe who weren't here yesterday, I'm Aaron Landsman, and I'm mostly gonna talk about the project that I am in process with, has been done in three cities called City Council Meeting, um, and. I want to talk about it in the context of most of the work. So there are two parts of my practice in life. One is I'm a second generation politicized, activated person with a progressive politics. And I'm also uh, an avowed formalist in terms of the way I make work. I just come from a group of artists who try to experiment with form as a primary motivating force and departure point for work. Um, and I've not often found ways to bring those two together. And I kind of happened into this project uh, that does bring those two practices together through form as a starting point. So I was in Portland, Oregon four and a half years ago. I saw a city council meeting where a guy in a suit dumped a bag of crap in front of the council, like heroin works, dirty diapers, used condoms, crack vials, and said, what are we going to do to clean up the city? And um, the count a council member stood up and said, well, you just created a public health hazard. And the guy said, without missing a beat, you just made my point better than I ever could have. And they cleared the room of 300 people so that they could disinfect with Lysol, and they brought us all back as if nothing had happened. And I was like, that's better theater than I've seen in a long, long time. And so, which is, a, I'm sure, just a comment on the work I was seeing at the time, right? But, um, but so, when I interrogated that further, I started reading about people like, Morgan mentioned Joseph Boyce, and Joseph Boyce said, art is politics and politics is art. Artists should be political leaders and turn politics into a, a, a form of performance because it would show up, you know, for him it would show up things about political structures that are there. So I started looking at the forms through which we govern ourselves and saying, oh, there's a semblance of, ac uh, of access, but a lot of people are really denied access just by the form, the procedures, the bureaucracy that are there. A lot of people who ought to have a voice in politics don't necessarily have that voice if you just look at the way the form is played out, right? So there are ethnographic studies of city council meetings that I read. Um, one minute already? Oh my god. Sorry. Um, uh, and so, uh, so this piece has evolved where I'm often bringing a formal conversation into a highly politicized situation. And I'm also acknowledging my, myself as an outsider, right? I'm a straight, white male from New York City imposing an artwork on a community that's not my own. So the eth I guess what I want to talk about in a smaller group session is the ethics of that and how, what are the best practices that I've found with my collaborators working on that kind of work. How do you make that okay? You have 25 seconds. Oh right? my goodness. <laughs> I think I'll stop there. You're at, okay, and then great. Go to a question. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is the portion of the morning where one person can ask a question to Aaron in response to what he just very quickly took us through, <laughs> which is kind of beautiful work compressed. Who's got a question for Aaron? Nick. Yeah, Aaron. Uh, I know that you've done work in these communities where you've not just shown up and yeah, yeah, yeah. work on there as well. And I'm, I'm just curious to know, uh, maybe we can get into it in the small groups, but what have you found to be best practices to prepare a community for what they're going to uh, experience? Great in, question. In, in a minute. It's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say, you know, uh, I hope this doesn't sound cliche, but uh, for me it's about being able to at least spend some time listening to the people who are there and actually asking them, like, OK, what's happening here? Um, and using that as a first step, as a departure point. Um, and then laying out really clear ground, work, uh, ground rules for me in terms of collaboration with people, whether it's a long-term or a short-term collaboration. So making people understand that there is always a dialogue about what the final product is, meaning if I'm interviewing you and that material is going to be part of the work, you're going to be compensated and credited and have some final say. The conversation yeah. is going to be between us about how that work ends up. So those kinds of things. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. How about uh, Marty? Is it okay if we bop down to the other end to you? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, oh, Polly, would you tie me one minute each? I just figured out a new way. One minute each. Yeah, one, yep. three one minutes. Thanks. You got it. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I'm a Mari Pottinger, still Mari Pottinger. Um, <laughs> and uh, so there's three projects I thought I'd talk about. Uh, one is City Water Tunnel number three, and it was a three year project, and it was about uh, as soon as I heard the city was building, New York City was building a tunnel that was as deep in the ground as the Chrysler Building, and it was blasting through rock that was 250 million years old, and that 25 people had already died, and that it was going to last us a 60-year-long project. I knew that um, two things, that I wanted to make an art project, that it was a perfect metaphor for how the kinds of investment and vision that would make a difference for us in terms of turning things around for the way society is being structured right now. And also that people there would make art, so it would already be making art, that you, a human being couldn't be there and not be making art, just in that kind of context. And so it ended up um, being a performance, and I did it, got to do it in Europe. It was very, very well received and in the U.S. And it got to include a video that was on site, one minute, and storytelling by the workers, and I collected photographs from the people that, um, the geologist and the safety man. So, each time it performed in New York, at least, there was an exhibit, so people got to have their work, and we did a two-day fair. So. Then Abundance was um, a four-year project, a national, in my mind, a national community arts project commissioned by seven cities that helped set up uh, about 30 interviews with multimillionaires and about 30 with minimum wage workers and um, asking them the same questions, um, and there's a whole series of them. There's a lot on the website about it. and so. I learned there probably the, one of my biggest takeaways, which was that when people, when anyone makes art, even a, a simple poem in their mind and then shares it, uh, five reliable outcomes started right away, is that people were able to show themselves more, they were able to hold contradictions more elegantly, they were able to connect with a sense of hope, uh, and they were able to, um, well, they make good poems, but anyway. <laughs> uh, Art at Work um, has been a project. I moved to Portland, Maine to do it. I work for the city. I'm in the city manager's office officially. I have, that is where I work. I have an office there. And the intention was to start a, and inspire a national uh, way of doing something, and that is solving non-arts municipal problems with arts projects. So, a couple quick examples are, it took a year, so it's about building relationships. It's about deciding to do what seemed to be impossible things, and just hanging in there. It's about showing up and learning other people's cultures and figuring out how that matches with what you're thinking. So the cops ended up writing poetry to improve low morale, which if you think about it is a very bad problem for a city and a community and for the cops. Um, it was featured on like CNN and it was an MS and W, whatever that station is, <laughs> their banner line. Free? Yeah. Great. And, uh, and the cops put little screensavers in their cars about Fox News, so depending on their politics. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who's, got a, who's got a question for, for Marty? Yeah. Uh, the relationship with the uh, the government, the local government of Portland, how did that come about and, you know, just, you know, how did you pitch the project? Yeah, here? really. So a minute. Um, I did, uh, the Center for Cultural Exchange, they had a border patrol raid in town and um, the center was a thriving arts place there and they commissioned me to write a play with community members. So I spent one week a month up there for a year and wrote the play. And the mayor was in the play, and the fire chief, and a, a homeless fellow who was very involved in the situation, and a lot of people. And so it really, it really won them over in a big way to what was possible. And, uh, and so they said, what else can you do? So for 2006, on my own money, I just went up there regularly and met people. And they were very hard to track down and meet, and just started building support and the idea. And then Nathan, none of this would have happened without Nathan Cummings Foundation who's given $75,000 a year for seven years now. So that's the, that's the rock that I stand on mm -hmm. in terms of making this possible. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mara. Yep. Mara? Oh, sure. Yeah. All right. Hi, I'm Laura Zabel. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that I would talk really briefly about three different kinds of collaborations that we've worked on. Um, I feel like our work is 
primarily about uh, cross-sector and, and sort of holistic community work. Uh, and we don't really do anything that doesn't involve people from outside of the arts community, because our mission is about how artists fit into the whole of a community as one part of what a community needs to be healthy. Um, All right, Laura, do you mind just, for people that are new, then just sort of reminding uh, your organization where you're Sure, from. I'm from Springboard for the Arts, which is based in Minnesota. Uh, so a program we started about five years ago is called Artist Access to Healthcare. Um, it's a program that's a partnership now uh, with a whole set of partners, but the core partners are five community clinics um, that we work with, and it really is uh, first and foremost about artists' access to healthcare, and then secondarily about how artists contribute to the sort of community clinic system and the resources that exist. And what I learned and what I think we learned from that is um, how much is possible through those kinds of partnerships and how much change is possible very rapidly by working across sectors. Um, we also run a program called Community Supported Art that's based on the community supported agriculture model. Uh, so instead of vegetables, you get art. Um, and <laughs> involves a, some really deep partnerships in the local food community and I think from that we learned uh, that that there is a common cause and that people have models in other sectors that we can borrow and use and learn from and that there is a, a lot of rich thinking and, and ideas um, if we sort of stretch our minds in terms of what who's in our community. Um, and then uh, this project called Irrigate that we're in the midst of now, it's a three year project um, in the middle of the city, in the Twin Cities, we're building a light rail uh, and it's going right through a number of neighborhoods who have a really high concentration of first and second generation immigrant owned business uh, and neighborhoods that have very real historic reasons to be worried about displacement. Um, this may be the biggest project we've ever done in this regard. It involves us and the city and uh, LISC, which is a national community development intermediary, plus six district councils, 150 business owners, and now over 500 artists. <laughs> um, we do one-day trainings for the artists, and the only requirement is that you have to live, work, or have an investment in the neighborhood. Um, and then the artists design small, uh, intentionally small-scaled projects in partnership with small business owners and neighborhood organizations uh, to address some of the challenges of the construction and um, to change the narrative about what is happening in those neighborhoods and who has agency and, and voice there. Um, I think two things that we talked about last night that I feel like are important is that for us, I really feel like there's a spectrum of partnerships. So on one end are partners that we just pay to be our friend because we think they're important to the work. And then there are very, very deep, you know, loving partnerships that go on for a long time. Um, and the other thing that really struck me after yesterday's conversations about translation is that I feel like our work, a lot of our partnerships are really rooted in practicality and that that's, that's that open window for us, is how do we make something practical together. Great. Yep. Who's got a question for you? You talked about how uh, the cross-sector collaborations uh, produce some form of rapid change. Um, how come, what's, how, why is it so efficacious, or why, what, what makes it, can you just elaborate on that? Sure, yeah. um, because they have totally different resources and expertise, and so together then twice as much, if not more, is possible. So in that healthcare project, we started from the perspective of how do we change the insurance system, um, which for an organization made up of 15 artists, <laughs> proved fairly daunting. Um, <laughs> But once we started making partners in the actual healthcare community and learning more about what the system actually is and what resources exist, we were able to leverage these amazing resources that already exist and help navigate that system for people. We've sent 5,000 artists to the doctor through that program and 98% of them find a home for their ongoing healthcare because that already existed and I didn't have to make it. I just used what they have. <laughs> right. Thanks, Laura. Carlton, you Good morning. How y'all doing? Morning. Right. My name is Carlton Turner. I am the executive director of Alternate Roots, which is a member service organization based in Atlanta, Georgia, that serves 14 southern states in the District of Columbia, and it works, at the, uh, works with artists who are working at the intersection of arts and activism. I'm also the co-director and founder of Mugabe, uh, which is Men Under Guidance Acting Before Early Extinction. Uh, which is a performance group uh, that consists of my brother and myself uh, that deals with uh, jazz, uh, spoken word, hip-hop, and non-traditional storytelling. 
Um, and the basis of all of our work is collaboration. Um, and I say that because uh, coming out of a community, uh, living in Raymond, Mississippi, where there is no arts infrastructure, uh, there is no philanthropic infrastructure, uh, you build collaborations to find the resources that you need to do the work that you need to change the, the systems in your community. Uh, and so you find yourself connecting with organizations and institutions that have something that you need to correct uh, or fill a void that's already in your community. Um, and so I just think about uh, both the practical, uh, I love the, the practicality of what a collaboration is, um, and so I begin, the work with Alternate Roots as well is all about building partnerships and relationships. So uh, some of the relationships that we've built through Alternate Roots is uh, working with an organization called Project South for the Elimination of Poverty and Genocide, yeah. uh, which is an organization that is uh, an underground grassroots activist organization that is working to change the realities uh, and empower people to change their realities in communities in the South. Uh, they serve the same areas that Alternate Roots does. And so about, about eight or nine years ago, we began developing a sister relationship with this organization, realizing that there was both a deficiency in the creative arts as practiced in the activist world, and also there was a, a void of, of, our, of the artists that we were working with that knew they wanted to take on these challenges in communities, but didn't really have the knowledge and the understanding about what the issues really were from a policy and, and, and an advocacy standpoint. Uh, so building these relationships with uh, Project South, which is about really building a movement and empowering uh, the, the South to actually change the tides, um, is a really good opportunity for us. And also the U.S. Social Forum, uh, which Alternate Roots has worked with since its very inception. The first one was hosted by Project South in Atlanta, and we have been one of the sole cultural forces uh, on the planning committee to help develop those initiatives um, across the country. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I, I would like to just kind of throw out as questions to you guys to consider as we break into small groups is, um, as we talk about cross-sector collaboration, uh, to what end? Uh, what, is the, what is the end that we're trying to get um, in terms of building collaborations? And also, do we have strategies and theories for um, how things will change? Uh, so do we, have a, do we have a theory of change when we go into these collaborations? Mm -hmm. It's not always necessary, I think, is also openness to develop, um, you know, to, to have that openness of what may happen when these two things get in a room that, together that haven't been. But it's also important for us to have strategies and understand about what it is that we want to achieve in the long term. Um, so, is yeah, that it? That's it. So I'm done. Right the, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Question for Carlton. I got 10 I can ask about. Start with <laughs> Yeah. No, I got people here. Yeah, the um, question is about, um, I'm, all, I'm always amazed about the work that you do um, and being able to marshal resources in, in an environment of, suppose, you know, of perceived scarcity. And, um, and you know, the work that you do individually as well as the alternate routes, and I think that's something I've admired from afar. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, like concrete strategies to really identify resources in your network that really allow you to do what you do. Um, so I would say just, just quickly, I think uh, having relationships with, with funders is a cross-sector collaboration uh, because many of them are not artists and they don't understand the work that is being done on the, on the ground. So, so the development of those relationships is an ongoing and long-term um, development process. Um, and so some of the work that Nick and myself, our companies have been doing with Race Peace, uh, we've been able to, to work directly with funders to provide uh, dialogue and spaces for conversations about issues of race uh, with people who are actually controlling resources. So that has been a, a, a partnership that has allowed us to really infiltrate and, and have greater stake in that conversation. But in terms of the resources that, that we need to do our work, I think it's um, you know, just recognizing that we have, that it's a, it is a development spectrum that we have to be working on. And for us, it's about understanding what it is that we, one of the things that we've been initiating with Roots is site visits. So actually spending time in communities before we make decisions about where we're going to put our organizational resources um, so that we understand clearly what we can provide as a resource, what the needs are of that community, and what assets we already have within our own network to help fill some of those spaces. That's been a really important um, strategy that we've been uh, putting in place in this last round of, of grants. Thanks, Carl. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Which, which way do you stand? My turn. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm Michael Rote, and I'm the founding artistic director of Sojourn Theater, which is a 15-year-old ensemble-based company. Um, there's 15 of us. Uh, some projects we're working on right now. We're working on a project called Islands of Milwaukee in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 
which is a multi-year project where we're collaborating with um, homebound seniors uh, who are socially isolated due to economics and health issues. We're working with them in their homes uh, and their caregivers and goodwill. We're also partnered with the Department of Public Transit and the Department of Public Health in Milwaukee. And we're creating a performance and art-based work of different disciplines within the homes and then using uh, technology and live performance, bringing that work out into the community that will culminate in a large performance a year and a half from now in downtown Milwaukee. The goal is we are working with partners to catalyze more public dialogue about the system challenges for folks living in socially isolated contexts. Um, so that's a project we're working on. We're working on something, uh, we're artists in residence with Catholic Charities USA uh, for a two year period where we in teams of our company members are out at different sites around the country uh, working at poverty reduction sites uh, within poverty programs, doing interviews, creating performance, offering workshops and collaboration and other kinds of creative practice that are helping those communities host public dialogue around issues of poverty. Uh, we have a project called Built which is a project that works with planning commissions uh, and county agencies around the US where we've developed um, a game structure that involves story and facilitation and we actually uh, become the public engagement tool for uh, particularly rural communities and economically challenged areas where it becomes a way that community members are brought together to have conversation about the allocation of resources. Uh, and then we have a project called How to End Poverty in 90 Minutes that we ran in Chicago this spring and uh, is a show where an audience of at least 200 comes together and a large portion of the box office goes on stage in a big glass bowl uh, and the entire goal of the 90 minutes is that the audience has to figure out together how to spend that uh, money to attack poverty in their local community. So that's going to be in Louisiana this coming year and also in DC the following fall. I also run something called the Center for Performance and Civic Practice uh, which includes which particularly is about capacity building amidst artists around cross-sector work and a lot of advocacy work in non-art sectors for how artists and their assets are and can continue to be of use in cross-sector projects. Uh, we're about to actually announce the Catalyst Initiative where the Center for Performance Civic Practice is going to actually be granting artists and small organizations around the country uh, bits of money and, and offering capacity building with their community partners so that we can begin to document and catalog the amazing work going on around the country so that we all have uh, models of work that are um, diverse and have lots of different kinds of record of them. So, that's my time. Who's got a question for me? I'm still dating myself. Yes. <laughs> I'm self facilitating. Yes. Can, uh, can you give a, an example of one of the solutions that was um, reached by the high end poverty in the minutes? Yeah, that? sure. The, the show, we worked for a year and a half on it with tons of community partners. And what we decided with our partners who have all kinds of expertise on poverty, which we did not, do not, uh, five categories. Um, making opportunities, system change, daily needs, education, uh, and individual needs. So an audience had those categories as starting places for sort of the, the event where they explored those categories. It was a lot of performance, a lot of cameos by members of the public and people who deal with poverty and are living in poverty were sort of a part of that conversation. And then all five of those categories chosen by lottery had different beneficiary organizations at every performance, different every performance, who self-defined as their work fell under those categories. So at every performance, a different category would be chosen and would be sort of um, pulled apart. So, um, and they really, it, each category like got the money several different times, so there was no consistent answer. But those were the strategies that sort of the audience could kind of explore together. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Polly Carl. All time. All right. Uh, I'm Polly Carl. I'm the editor, uh, director of HowlRound. Uh, and uh, HowlRound is essentially a series of communications platforms. So there's a television channel, which we're watching, people are watching us now. Uh, we have a, um, sadly, for how I dressed this morning. And then. Which um, is uh, very unlike how you usually Yeah, I know, right? Exactly. Thank you. And, uh, um, and, so, and then also, um, uh, we also are, we have an online journal, uh, we have an interactive data map, uh, and uh, in a, a kind of in a rare moment in terms of talking to you about our kind of translation challenges, 
Um, I feel like I'm the most conventional person uh, in the room because I work, as I say that's a rare moment that I'm the most conventional person in the room, uh, <laughs> that, uh, because I work, um, we work really very specifically within the theater field. And you know, my background is working in a, a playwriting organization for many years and seeing um, this incredible dissonance between the resources, what, what artists had to live on, and the actual resources and where they were going. So our work is really about shining a light on the work of a lot of the, many of you in this room so that we can re rethink and redirect resources into what would be potentially more impactful places in our community. So, so we really don't spend as much time working cross-sector as we do supporting others who are working cross-sector um, for uh, the field to see the work that you're doing. Uh, and uh, I would just say that um, you know the um, the real translation challenge for us in that as a and I put this in you know the sort of um, uh, hardest quotation marks as an organization because we're very lightly organized in this way. But the real translation challenge for us has been that in our field in the th in the theater field, the eye of the artistic vision, the I think the work we should do is this kind of work that that eye of the artistic vision is what has driven all of where the resources are going in our field. And we're trying to turn that around and really um, be about the we of the community and, the, and, and be a kind of deep listening organization. And to get people to understand that that's how we work. So if you're an organization and you're raising money, for example, the key is that you have to be able to say what your vision is. And I can only say that my vision will be determined by what you tell me are the needs of the of the community, of your community. Mm -hmm. And so trying to get people to understand that this reverse notion of the curation process, mm -hmm. and then um, our, you know, really thinking about what that reverse notion of the curation process um, can mean ultimately for artistic practice within conventional theater institutions, but also for within the kinds of, many of the kinds of institutions that you're working in. So mm -hmm. that's, um, that's pretty much, and then we're going to talk later about our next project, which is all about resources to value, and we're going to do that in the end, so. Who's got a question for Bob? Yes. Um, and this is kind of a cumulative question, I guess, for the group, but specifically, um, I'm starting to develop this notion of theater that goes to people rather than theater that people go to. Mm. And I'm just now exploring and wondering if you could bounce back a little bit about like where does that decision get made to be <laughs> more active with your theater work? Yeah, I think it's such a, I mean that's the, that's the, you're asking the thing we're thinking about and the challenge. And so the big question becomes, because we have all this infrastructure and we have all these buildings, is uh, how do you get the theater to come, you know, how do you get the people to come to you with their ideas about community? So I think probably we've been thinking, uh, 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 you know, we've been shining a light on a lot of people who are taking theater right into communities, which I think is a, a different thing in a sense. And we've been thinking more primarily about you have these really large institutions that are way over-resourced. How do you get those institutions to be a reflection of the voice of the communities that they live in? So it's a kind of reverse of, I'm the artistic director, and I think you should all really desperately need to see Romeo and Juliet again, or whatever that is, because I think that's what the community needs to, you know, you, us hearing what the community needs and then figuring out how we almost, you know, co-program that way. Yeah. That's exactly what um, Everybody take a deep breath, or at least me. <laughs> <laughs> That's over. <laughs> well done. Well done. Yeah. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> distinction language-wise to the conversation that she said might be helpful. Um, and actually, I think a lot of what we talked about last night came up in, in, this, in what we just shared, Carl, in the questions that you asked. Uh, and it's just thinking about what Polly just said about listening. As we spoke last night, a lot of our work was about relationship building and listening, and what that means in our practices and in our relationships um, within our field and across to other fields. Uh, Lars talking about this thing that I um, talked about.
talk about a bunch when trying to kind of make sense or sort through what community-based or community-engaged or theater for social change or cross-sector kind of work means, because there's really a lot of language around it. Uh, and I particularly found, I'm, I'm based in Chicago, but, but we work in a bunch of places, that it really has gotten challenging for a lot of organizations that are non-art-centered to know what an artist means when they come to them and ask for a partnership. Mm -hmm. Because so many artists and arts organizations at times are coming to them and partner means different things. Mm -hmm. And what they want, they want different things. They have different needs in a given context or project. So something that's helped me and that I've been trying to, to, to work with uh, a bunch has been this idea of social practice and civic practice. Uh, and then the, the simplest way of saying it is social practice generally, which of course has a long history in the visual arts field, the installation field, and so this definition is partly related to that, but also is trying to be useful in the performance and theater field in particular. Social practice uh, relates to projects that initiate with an artist's concept or vision. And the partnerships or engagement that come across the process of that project are coming to basically fulfill or work towards the need or vision of something that an artist or arts organization has initiated. So a social practice project is um, artist impulse in a way. That doesn't mean there's not completely authentic and excellent collaboration, all the, an amazing process happening. But it's different than civic practice, which are projects that stem from a relationship that develops between an artist and a non-arts partner, where the artist is uh, listening and in collaboration learning about the needs that the non-arts partner is expressing, and then designing artistic practice in response to those needs. It, the lines blur. Lots of projects are both. And lots of artists do both. But I'm particularly finding working with city agencies in larger cities that that distinction is really helpful. Because a lot of times social practice projects are about an institution trying to survive and sustain in the current economic uh, climate. And so they have ideas for interesting projects, but the partnerships they're building are to develop new audiences and find new funding sources, as well as do work that's meaningful to them. And the civic practice projects are sort of um, correlate to an interest in seeing what kind of new work artists can develop in response to the needs of non-arts partners. So for me, that definition has been useful and just something to sort of help start conversations. That, that said, uh, we, were there other things that we did not talk about? Marty, there's the thing you wanted to make sure we said about how language can both be of service but also a disservice in cross-sector work and how complicated it is to find useful language. So maybe the thing I just said is a part of that conversation. Well, that's pretty clear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's so just, just with academia playing a kind of helpful and unhelpful role in just about everything, probably. <laughs> um, just to, you know, I'm often out distanced in pretty basic conversations about this work at this point, just because that wasn't my education, that wasn't my experience, and a language has been developed with as much intention to obscure and um, colonize uh, practice as to clarify and elucidate and expand. So just to be mindful of that. Almost like you got to wash your head out every now and then, right? <laughs> or your mouth. <laughs> uh, other, are there other things anyone up here wants to sort of put into the room before we split into small groups and, and we'll offer that prompt around translation to get there, but does anybody feel like there's something that we talked about that you want to make sure gets said? Well, well, I feel like we had a, I, I don't know if this is, um, oh, I don't know, this might be going the wrong place, but I'm just going to say it anyway, which is, there is a, we had a really kind of deep moment, I thought, in last night's conversation about who translates where, yeah. um, that I thought was really important, you know, because I feel there's a way in which, I'm just going to speak personally, we can't shut the TV up, oh, never mind. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm just going to speak personally for a minute to say, um, you know, that the um, there's something about where I feel I'm able to translate and what that intervention can be, uh -huh, right. and where, and, and so, and I was just saying, you know, in the way in which I have been othered uh, so often in my life, I have a limitation about where I can translate and where I intervene as an artist. 
Uh, and so I'm very acutely aware of that, and that's super right. different from where Aaron and Michael feel they can intervene. And so we just, I, I feel like I, w I want the conversation as we go into the small groups to be safe for everyone to say, you know, we really, we bring, and I think, you know, Mirla, you were talking about this yesterday, I mean, you're, you're bringing your trauma, you know, where you can intervene, is you're bringing all of these things with you, you know, and so I just, I, I feel like that's such an important point because there's a, Again, I say this very carefully, but there can be a kind of easy um, righteousness about cross-sector yeah. collaboration that I want us to be careful about uh, in the conversation. I, as in just me personally, not, mm -hmm. you know, you all can do what you want. But um, so anyway, that's my, um, I just wanted to and say that. Can I just, uh, to, yeah. to tag off that, I mean, the, the conversation also came out of me saying, uh, in this project and in other projects, I sort of have thrived on being able to go into conversation with people who I feel very differently from about most issues, but also carrying with me a lot of the privileges that get me in that room to have that conversation with, say, a very conservative city council member from Bismarck, North Dakota, who's now become my friend, but is we disagree about. And so those initial conversations where we find common ground or provoke an ability to then have a deeper, more perhaps adversarial conversation later that he can actually hear and that I can hear, right? Uh, but that I don't expect everyone to have to do that work, right? I'm there because of a certain privilege that I bring, um, skin privilege and gender privilege, and so I wouldn't say that then everybody has to do that. Some people don't have, but I, I don't think, I think everybody self-selects that. So I think that's part of the challenge and then meeting that challenge on your own terms in a way that works best for people, I think. And, and it was, and I just will add, it, I think it's, it's, it's perfectly articulate, I think that you know, part of what we were struggling with yesterday at the end of the day was the sense of not feeling like the translation was happening very well around that, and that is one of the reasons why. I, and, and I, you know, I, I res really respect the work they were doing, but I think we were struggling with that translation, and I wanted, that's what, partly why I wanted to say that, because we left, at the end of the day, we, we hadn't really come back to that. Right. I just want to, just, in addition to that, there was this other piece about values, mm -hmm. and, and, and we talked a lot about values yesterday, and especially when you're doing um, work, building relationships with institutions. Um, you know, it's hard for an institution to have a value, um, you know, because values are so personal, they're so intimate to the individual, uh, and, and building collective values is really tricky. And so how do we, how do we maintain that understanding of, of how we're dealing with values in, in the process of building relationships? Because sometimes within the relationship, your, your values get tested, and you're also testing the values of, of, the, of the institution or the organization you're working with. Yeah. So values came up a lot as well yesterday. And values in relation to resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It feels like we're, I, don't know, I feel like we're at the point where we could all, so we should, we should go into smaller groups where we can have conversations, where more folks can have a chance to sort of talk and be in that. So if our goal was to do six, again, not so we could lead the conversation, but so we could each be in one. So I'm just trying to think geographically here. Uh, looks like if we, I guess the thing is though, so a lot of you, I don't know, do you feel like it would be good to mix up? Are you sitting with the people you know best, or do you think these are the right groups? Like, if I just go table. Table fine? Yeah. 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 You can mix up. Yeah. 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 So, so why don't we say, uh, why don't we all, each of us will sort of go around and help find a group and bring a group together. Yeah. Oh, we're in 20 minutes. 20 minutes. 20 minutes.
Well, this is not. I mean, it's a plus X ring arrow. I don't know. 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 I don't Yeah. 
And there's a history of those definitions being placed that artists have to deal with, whether wittingly or unwittingly, which is like, there have been plenty of artists that have made plays about the homeless by mining them for stories and taking credit, you know? So I think there was a lot of work found in this vision. Yeah. So we make an Several, you've got a lot of 
Well, then I think you're translating with partners who are bringing you or the new interaction with you about what, 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 what is the hope built around it. So that, I mean, for me, I think it's really important to facilitate conversation and that's enough of an option for me. You know, I'm a huge, I don't know if you guys know this, Gracie uh, Monument project. This, this, have you seen it? It's really worth going to check out. It's problematic, like a lot of work, like this is problematic, but my own work is problematic. But it's like, there's a Swiss artist, Thomas Hirshhorn, who made a series of monuments to his favorite philosopher in neighborhoods of mostly people of color or poor neighborhoods around the world. This is the last time it's going to be used. He does it by contacting the person in this case, getting him on board. And then everyone who works on the vision of the kid who saves from the city. But his book, he says, I'm not making more for the community. I'm making the community for our cause. And he wants people to engage with his own questions about going off and trying to get to the city. He also wants, like, Right. wondering about how you measure your success or your progress with partners who may see art yeah, yeah, yeah. and what you're doing very differently, especially um, in a partnership where they insist on quantitative measures that maybe are not really the kind of thing that you're used to having to deal with. Uh -huh. Uh huh. Right. And then, um, uh, to, to the the translation is very In other words, the evaluation forced a kind of introspection that wasn't there at first. I think that's really important. I think 
I know you're, you're a new graduate from a theater program. program. So that's why I feel like what is happening in theater training in terms of like, so engagement with the community as opposed to sort of art as a, sort of a pure thing in and of itself? So anyone who's you know, been in school recently like to hear their opinion? <laughs> Not enough. I mean, I think we're, I think we feel a little bit more, and, like that was one of the more successful iterations of the project, because we had three or four different points of view on it. We went from this, like, bureaucratic procedure to procedure. I'm going to interrupt for one moment with great apologies not to end these, but something that we had talked about was at this point in the morning, uh, asking each table in the next two or three minutes, as you sort of wind down this part of the conversation, to choose, uh, as Marty said, it's either a delight, a highlight, an insight, or what we came up with an in quite. <laughs> Inquire, a question, something, some, one or two things that you want to bring back to the larger group out of this conversation. And the key is, we're not asking you to reiterate the 20 minute conversation you just had. We're sort of, we're sort of asking you, are there a couple threads or questions where you're like, this could be great to offer into the larger room because once we share those five things from each table, we will get to have a whole room conversation for a little while, and we'll see where your highlight inside the lighting quite pick us. So two or three minutes, and then we'll all room together. <laughs> What's going to stick in my mind is what Marty said about the uh, evaluation driving the, the insight. I thought that was, I, I, that's a key takeaway for me. Like, instead of like, oh, I'm being judged, I'm being measured, something to be feared, it's like something it's like the culmination of your work. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Right. And what I'm thinking in my mind is how more traditional theaters um, engage with their audiences and um, they'll have talkbacks or they'll have surveys to hang out. But there's something really lacking there that I think. Yeah. 
six-foot-long poem or something will have a ripple effect on the community. Uh, we talked about people may, might be afraid to share art or to make art and finding one thing that is more powerful than their fear. Finding that balloon item that is big enough to unify everybody, but at any point could be fragile enough to pop. Something that we're really thinking about in terms of uh, unifying one another that could be a surprise and wasn't expected in the process of finding the product. Uh, we talked briefly about the different types of institutions that exist in the academic world and how some of them focus on like making this penultimate performer and some of them also have like the ability to uh, explore humanitarian efforts in art and where do those exist and why. Uh, we also talked about people's resistance against art and fear of art, as you said, but also the importance of just to keep showing up and to keep listening to people and to be there for them even when they don't know if they are safe there. Uh, one thing that uh, we learned is that the evaluation of the work, rather than just being sort of a necessary evil to satisfy your partners or funders, can actually drive insight into the work, both from the participants. Uh, we also talked about not always finding the differences between when you're going into a community, between you and the community, but focusing on the similarities sometimes is more positive. I think we're done. Yeah, group one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You guys want to grab your back of that box? Uh, I think the insight that we came away with here was uh, declare your own self-interest. And this is a quote from Neil Watkins. Niall Watkins. Naya, Naya Watkins. Um, declare your own self-interest. So the case study I kind of brought to the table was what happens when an institution, not an artist, steps into uh, a community for social practice, has an idea, right? So uh, was that social practice or civic practice? And specifically the case study um, is the Kennedy Center uh, and this festival we're co-producing with them and the importance of looking into the community of Washington, D.C., the local community, so that they can self-define mm -hmm. what the programming looks like on a local level for this much larger international festival. And uh, kind of the inherent challenges that come along with that. Um, and you got some kind of help me out. That was the case, so. No? <laughs> yeah. There was a semi-decent uh, argument going on over here yeah. uh, about uh, how much bandwidth these conversations about large institutions take up uh, in these conversations. But Pakalta made a really good point that um, we have to, with the example of the Kennedy Center, be having this dialogue because we're talking about public funding. 
and that when we also have the impetus to be over here making new institutions, that when we're talking about public funding, if we are going to be saying, well, we need to divert some of this public funding elsewhere, if that were the case, we have to have other structures that we're building simultaneously while we're also having this conversation about what to do with the institutions that already are, are doing the work. Uh -huh. yeah. nice, so, nice. It was really nice. And then point. One of the other things that um, I brought up was that when you go into a community, and that really um, piqued my interest to in bring that to the table, is when you go into a community, um, how do you uh, do it respectfully? When you're going into another territory and nation's indigenous community, how do you acknowledge that? How do you acknowledge the traditional leadership when you go in? And that sometimes is always extremely overwhelming. Yeah, group two. So we can imp we can just say some stuff. Um, I mean, we um, I mean, there. I guess. Well, I mean, what we I I guess like I was reflecting. He did. That's really good point about expectations. Oh, thanks. And expectations in terms of partnerships and how we bring our own expectations to the table and when they're not being met or they're being met in a different context, we have to recontextualize our, right. our value and our success stories. That's right, yeah. You said that. And there was <laughs> talked about um, the cross-sector thing is often between, has sounded like it's between artists and non-artists, mm. but we also talked about cultural difference and how to be sensitive to that. Great. I think we talked a little bit about rural and urban models of collaboration and how they differ even international and national and how they can, uh, how, how, our, how we bring in our own cultural notions mm. really really affect on both international, rural, urban settings, the way that we're able to speak to one another and translate very specifically. And uh, we, we did also speak about the, the, um, the difference of, uh, talking about um, cross-sector collaboration and different models of that, that uh, there is, there are certainly collaborations where the, the, uh, the intention is to tell a particular, uh, to give voice to a particular group of people uh, that aren't the artists, mm -hmm. you know, that are a, a different community. And then there's also the kind of, um, you know, I would I would venture to say the kind of work that we see here at the farm, where there's a, a specific group of artists with a very strong point of view, uh, but who, through their rigorous engagement with that point of view, are able to have these deep cross-sector collaborations around infrastructure around the kind of food that's used around um, all the other elements and those are both really vital uh, you know, points on that. Yeah. <laughs> Could have gone another way. <laughs> <laughs> A big part of what we talked about was language and experience and the tension that lies in between. Um, another thing we were wondering about is how does my role as an artist shift within a community? And how does that community influence me to do what I'm doing? Uh, another thing that came up a lot was the subtleties within experience and how do I honor my own authenticity while remaining true to the authenticity of the project I'm working on? For example, in theater for social or political change. Um, another big thing was relationship building as a big part of the collaborative process. Um, learning to trust someone through experience in interpersonal relationships rather than just through language. Uh, another thing was how do I remain present in my own work while also maintaining some sort of focus and willpower? How can I find the balance between suspension and willpower or listening in a relationship? And structure and goal action. Cool. I just think it was like really key that um, 
we talked about language being imperfect and it being okay that it was imperfect, and then it's really, um, uh, Javier was talking about how the project she's working on and how the first year, and so didn't you do this well, um, the first year, it doesn't matter how you were talking to people as long as you were talking to them. And for the first year, not being able to understand each other, but that first year being key to them wanting to jump in on the experience with you. And once the experience happened, then you could go from there. Um, yeah. Good four. Was that us? You're fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll report and then everybody toss in a hope. Uh, we kind of threw a monkey wrench on the world, uh, wondering what community is, and, and, and being transparent about the fact that you're never working with a whole community. You're always working with a subset of the community. Mm -hmm. You're all really listening to the people who invited you if you're, if you're in, in that invitation thing, if you're working with that, and to be uh, really cognizant of that. And then we've got to a real big question, which is um, how willing are we to, to question our own values as we listen to community, and it might adjust, it might be different. I mean, if we're really listening, or are we taking it on? And understanding that, even if we're trying, trying to be documentarian about it, and trying to really pay attention, we're still selecting, editing, and juxtaposing as artists. On some level, we're still guiding the work on some level. And so we were, we were talking a lot about that, and then, even if you're really clear on the intent, because we got to the point of transparency, just be transparent on every level of this, but even when you are as transparent as you can possibly be, and you're really trying to be as clear as possible in your language, that the language we use in this room, the language we use among ourselves, is likely to mystify our community <laughs> and partners, whether, that, you know, whether we're defining that community as an institution or an agency or a hospital or you know, a whole town. Mm -hmm. And even when if we're working with 500 people in, in a community, there's still the 6,000 that aren't in the room, That's right. whatever. And just to completely understand that. And uh, so it was kind of humbling over here. <laughs> yeah. uh, anything to toss in? Uh, there, there was a great question that came up right at the very end. So we didn't get into a conversation Amen. about it, which was about, yeah. um, are you also, are you asking for an invitation? Are you being invited into a community? And who is bringing the resources to provide that interaction? Is it the institution? Is it the artist coming in with resources? Is it the community itself? Is it the non-arts partners? And where, where do those resources come from, and what's the values or the politics, or what does that mean, basically? That's By resources, we're talking about money, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the power that comes along. Yeah. yeah. Space and time with people, all kinds of things. Yeah. 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 All of which but a lot money. of it is money. Yeah. 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 Dirty good, but. Yeah. Yeah. Mutual need. So I want to suggest that, that um, the yeah. folks who sort of, uh, the kind of co-moderators, I'm wondering if having been in this conversation, uh, Marty, Laura, Carlton, Aaron, um, Polly, if, if any of you kind of listening to where we're at and these different lists of share outs have any particular things, just to, to start us as we move forward for the minutes that we have left, where they're really sort of sitting with you in terms of your own practice or just something you want to offer or make sure we're including in the conversation. So I wonder if any. I thought of three short things that are more like what you all did and we all did. Um, and that is that at least my ethics include having covert goals that are never shared with the partners. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about that for a minute, Marty. Talk about sort of the, the, the how and the why so you can unpack that a little for people. Well, um, yeah, the over goals, and I think there needs to be agreement on those, at least um, uh, a working agreement. But the covert goals, the example I use most often is that for me, one of my interests in working with the police, yes, the over goal was clearly uh, to improve the morale, and that's on behalf of the community and them, right? But the covert goal was and continues to be for me is that, that I weaken this project, this work weakens their ability to act in an oppressive, oppressive way and carry out orders with my understanding that the future is going to include lots of opportunities for them to do um, oppressive things in greater and greater instances. So 
Um, I, just, I just want to say I think that's really important that you name it that way and that you share your particular vocabulary for it because I feel like a lot of times in the field we get into conversations where people say, well, if an artist is working within the system, that no matter what they're doing, they're actually not doing the social justice work that needs to happen in terms of truly changing the system. And you're identifying for yourself a model where you're sort of doing both simultaneously, keeping some stuff to yourself and some stuff being part of the public partnership. Right, that's right. So just to... Yeah. Is there ever a part where you share? Does it come upon your process where it's okay to share your covert goals with your... I don't think with the cops, even though we... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. No, I think... What these guys over here brought up for me brought up the idea of transparency in our language is a very good word. Mm -hmm. But no, for, for, for participants, transparency is scary. If you're trying to talk about a system that is either oppressing them or or that is working towards evolution, they still know that system well. Mm -hmm. And to be transparent about how we're undoing that is very scary for mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's a real a, a, a word that we need to be very clear about, especially that it comes in stages and that, okay, this is the this is the plan. And people are like, I don't know. <laughs> Another just a, a kind of less exciting example, but um, pertinent is with the public service workers. There was a really high incidence of racism, race, racially based discrimination lawsuits within the department worker to worker, mm. and so um, we did uh, something called public works, which is storytelling with a particular group of them about their real heritage. So um, this place and mine, the notion of white heritage, it's one of the whitest states, if not the whitest state. We fight in Vermont for that, yeah. that title. Um, uh, um, to, to really, again, uh, kind of disintegrate and challenge, but from a very kind of user-friendly perspective, the notion of white heritage and actually give life and awareness to their actual ethnic heritages. And so, you know, like interviewing the war criminals in Yugoslavia, I had to find the words to, how do you say I'd like to interview because you did horrible and magical like, heinous things. And um, you know, so I, there I used the word misbehavior. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you find language that actually allows a conversation and a connection to begin? And so with the, it never said you're, you're, you're racist, so. You know, we're doing a project so you're not so racist. <laughs> but after getting to know them, the word racism, you know, was was able to be used, but really after the project was over, we just Thanks Marty. Yeah. I feel like it's more, I want to see if Laura, Carlton, and Polly are I, I just have one comment, which is, I, I think, uh, from this table, the, this idea that language is likely to mystify. I, I just, you know, I, I feel like, I, I just know the things I really want to think more about. I keep thinking, I, I, I feel like my work is always about struggling for clarity, both when I'm, um, I mean, as a dramaturg, as a, you know, producer, as a, you know, I'm always thinking about translation, you know, how are people watching and reading. And, and I think the thing that I'm most surprised about always is that the things that are utterly clear to me both mm -hmm. in uh, both in language and in you know communication are uh, uh, completely mysti you know mystifying uh, people around me and I, I think we, that the, the amount of time that we don't like to spend in our whether it be in institutions or in our artistic practice thinking about clarity and we had a kind of shocking moment um, I, I thought in the uh, at, at Round when we invited 16 people um, when we purposely invited, I would have invited Kim Hecky asked him. Um, so uh, we, we purposely invited 16 people uh, to come and talk to us about, you know, what how they perceived us, and we invited people who we thought were totally insiders in a sense, you know, because we it was like a, you know, we were trying to do something safe but provocative for us, and we it was stunning. Uh, how little they knew, and these were our closest. Uh -huh. These were our closest people to us. They had watched the journey, gone through it with us, and the we were like, "Oh my God!" And so um, that was one of the greatest things we ever did. And I think we'll do it all. The t you know, we'll keep doing that. Let alone asking people who are way outside. Um, you know, what we're doing. So, wow. It's not dissimilar, it seems to me, from working on lots of projects where you have partners who don't consider themselves sort of within the art practice but are partnering with you mm -hmm. in artistic practice somehow and throughout the process sort of being in conversation about getting reflections back on what they're experiencing and on what they're seeing and on what they're making. There's a, a ton to learn from that. A ton to learn from that. Laura, do you have anything you want to offer?
Um, I, conti I continue to be really interested in this question of, of examining how, or being intentional about how we let partnerships affect our own values and change our own, uh, even our own, you know, goals and outcome and, and uh, work and, um, I mean, that's, that I am very attracted to that idea, but I am also conscious that there is a spectrum of, of purpose and intention, and, and um, so I'm just very interested in, in that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing that just the, the whole thing about relationships uh, and, and a cross sector partnership is no different from any other relationship right. you encounter mm -hmm. or engage in, that, that it's a constant state of negotiation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and negotiating both your values and your purpose and your intention uh, and what you want to see happen as a result of this relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and you can choose to get into a um, uh, um, one night stand, uh, or you can get into a situation which you're trying to build a long term relationship and grow old together. Um, and the differences in, in, in just the psychological, you know, point of entry for those different types of relationships is really important. And the investment. And the investment, mm -hmm. and what you're willing to give up, because ultimately, um, if you're going, the, the whole thing about as artists, we come in with our own ideas, um, and some of that has to be given up in the process of building a relationship mm -hmm. and, and being open and honest about you know what things you're willing to give up and what things you're not um, and also allowing space for that to be articulated from the other party um, and it allows for relationships to, to, to really be stronger and last longer and then another thing that we talked about here was just the importance of building networks um, and I think it's about really filling the gaps of, of, um, of need in our own communities and our own uh, lack of systems and um, it's just a lot of good conversation. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with uh, this mm. group of folks. Aaron, is there something on your mind? The only thing to add, I would just to tag off these last two or three comments, is that I, I have found that the kind of ensemble theater creative process is what I find it like the fact that that allows for an incredible amount of discomfort and disagreement and ultimate resolution is something that I think is of value to. Arts and non-arts partners who just don't work in that way. And the other thing that I think is of value is the time that it takes, right? So it's this incredibly time-consuming process. ERS takes three years to make a show, and a lot of that time is wasted. Or seems wasted at the time, but it reflects back in the product. And so I feel like that, while I'm actually less and less wedded to whether or not I'm making theater at all, I do feel like the, the process of being vulnerable and uncomfortable with a group of people who may or may not share certain beliefs or values is the thing that I can bring to it and it also allows me to listen, allows other people to then feel like oh, I'm comfortable listening and not being entirely comfortable here, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it, I mean, I think that right off of that, I mean, the thing that, that, I would, um, that, that I would add would be around this translation issue, I have found trying to name the assets that artists bring to the table uh, in different fields and sectors really interesting and curious and at times challenging. And I have actually um, sort of whittled them down to what I find useful in a lot of uh, non-arts rooms. And that is talking about collaboration, expression, and design. Uh, and I, I don't, uh, collaboration, which means what it sounds like it means, and expression, <laughs> which, which sort of also, I, I sort of talk about expression meaning synthesizing, uh, complex narratives, data, or ideas into something that can be both understood and interrogated. And that to me is something very particular that an artist brings. Not just we will deliver a story or a message, but that we actually have tools to uh, make meaning and also make events and spaces where um, critical thought can be brought to those ideas and messages. And then the third being design, which I think has been co-opted a ton by the, by the visual arts. Uh, world and sort of industrial design complex, which is uh, <laughs> design is, is partially a visual form, but it's not entirely actually. Definitions of it are basically um, collaboratively solving problems by bringing uh, the imaginative act to the problem solving process. So it, that tends, to, those three words tend to be really useful outside of art settings when trying to look at, well, what tools do we have? Because you know, most people, if you're a theater artist, and you go and you talk to the Department of Health, or you go and you talk to uh, whatever community organization or hospital, they assume when you make the meeting or when you start to build a relationship that you're basically saying, I can make a play for you. Right. That's what they assume. Because with any discipline we're in, the, the traditional outcome or output 
of our discipline is how people not in our discipline generally receive an invitation unless we're in a deeper conversation. So trying to talk about, well, we actually have tons of assets and practices and skills and experiences of dramaturgy, of meaning making, of collaboration, of design and expression that we can bring to lots of projects that don't just look like plays. Yeah. Yeah. But the ways that we have learned to build performance offer us many, many tools useful in many, many contexts. So just thinking about you know, the fact that that's how we're heard, if that's the beginning of the conversation. I was at a thing recently where a question towards the end of the thing was, so uh, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to get my first contact, and I want to sort of express to them like, what I think I can do for them. This was a, a leader of an ensemble company on the West Coast talking about trying to connect with community organizations. And just saying, like, well, you actually don't have to have your first meeting where you tell them what you can do for them. Mm -hmm. You can have your first meeting where you ask to learn more about what they do. You don't even have to start by saying, what are your challenges? You might get there, but you can say, what do you do? I want to learn about what you do. And that's going to help me bring the assets I have into a collaborative design approach to figuring out what we can do together. So I just want to sort of put that in the, in the conversation. We do have um, a question coming across the internet from the great Joan Shirley, who is watching somewhere. Should I say hi, Joan? Hi. hi. If, you don't, if you don't know, Joan's one of the founders of Del Arte, an amazing, uh, uh, brilliant artist. And she has a question for us, and the question is? The question is, since the demise of the Community Arts Network, is there any central place where people are posting and archiving research, case reports, etc.? We at Del, uh, Del Arte have been researching with what Michael Road called cross-sector work for about five years through our MFA program, where third-year students do an extensive project with a community partner. We and they have learned a lot for the various missteps as well as positive outcomes. We'd love for the MFAs and the grads who are basing their life work in CDA to be able to learn more about current practice and experiments across the country, as well as make contact with others doing life work. Any resource suggestions beyond net and altern alter alternate routes, etc., would be welcome. Thank you. So we could, there's a big list. So maybe Carlton can start. I would say uh, definitely <clears throat> um, the Imagining America's Public uh, piece of their doing, which is online magazine. Journal called Journal. Public. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the work that uh, the Hemispheric Institute is doing. Um, with their documents that they're creating online, as well as uh, some of the convergence that they're doing to have conversations. Uh, Roots is about to start a new online publication as well. Um, so uh, Animating sort of Democracy has a site with tons of case studies and white papers and material and evaluation. How around? How around? How around? Uh, Center, the Center for Performance Study Practice has a whole page of resources which links to blogs and reading resources and stuff. But we miss Community Arts Network. We do. We miss Community Arts Network. Other other site other resources people know. Uh, I would say Maribel Alvarez's Arts in a Changing Arts America, Arts America. Mm -hmm. is a great mm -hmm. blog that mm -hmm. has great articles. Other folks. Uh, I would just say this, uh, which is I would offer. I was going to say this anyway as a kind of closer, but I'll say it now to um, answer Joan's question, which is, uh, you know, I think it would be so great to document this conversation about translation mm -hmm. and, and how around, or just because I feel like the whole weekend, mm -hmm. this weekend conversation, I feel it would be great, and so. Uh, we will, of course, say yes to 100% of the submissions that will come from this um, uh, opportunity. So as many of you who want to write uh, some reflections about it, and then I think, you know, just yes to uh, your students, Joan, uh, we would love to have them sharing their work with, um, you know, the kind of 25,000 readers of HowlRound, um, which goes out of it's, uh, it's theater, but it also goes around um, around the country in a lot of different sectors, surprisingly. So. And my, my blog series at HowlRound is actually called Translation. And your so blog maybe I called maybe I'll like make a call to this community in that, yeah. like just with a short entry and say, hey, folks, write stuff, and let's get around it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, other thoughts for Joan before we move the conversation uh, forward? Tucson Pima, uh, mm. uh, they're creating so a website. Oh. What did you say, Mark? I'm sorry, I just didn't hear you. Tucson Pima, uh, Roberto Bedoya, yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and, and uh, Leia are, um, are creating a, a new website mm -hmm. that I think they hope to launch soon. Uh, that is about uh, placement and comments. Um, I would say that NEA, too, the Artworks yeah. blog has, you have to sort of sort through, but there's interesting stuff on there, and they take <laughs> submissions as well. Roadside Theater also just finished their yes. archiving of their 
kind of life's work, and that includes all the case studies and work that they've done over the last 40 years. That was a big project of theirs. Awesome. They're moving mainly online in many ways. So. Art of Arts the Rural. Oh. Art of the Rural. Art of the Rural. And Arts and Democracy also has a lot of resources on their website. And we actually um, published a series of conversations called Bridge Conversations, mm -hmm. which were all about cross-sector collaboration. A it's a book, and it's also online. Awesome. Uh, Bob, Bob oh, Leonard is putting together funding to start uh, up, try and start a new CAN uh, out of Virginia Tech. That we bring a lot of these resources together, as is um, Here's the, oh, Cornerstone Theater got a big grant to try to create an online thing called The Junction. It would be a site of publication and archiving as well. And an invitation that um, if somebody wants to start the, the con something that consolidates all of these sites, you know, because there's so many that it's almost overwhelming of yeah. where to look. Yeah. Which is a better problem than there was 15 years ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, a, but a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Challenge. How much more time do we have, Michael? We, we have exactly 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 more minutes, okay. Matthew, do you have anything else that you need before the 10 minutes is up? I mean, yeah, I just like. I know, I just you know. <laughs> Marty, I was going to open up some, but do you have a direction you'd like to take us or a thought? No, it, it, just that thing about I think we're in good shape. I think we're, we're building muscle and relationships to face what's coming and turn things around. And I, I'm just thrilled that art and artists have that we are exactly where we are. I think it's, it's um, not mm, an accident, but to everyone here, I just think it's going to be a great ride ahead. <laughs> yeah, I just have one question that came up for me in what Matthew said yesterday about holding on to ancestral knowledge. And I was thinking about Marty's work uh, where, with the American Festivals Project. <coughs> some people in this room may know and some people may not. And my question yesterday leaving was, what's the role of institutional memory in this country, where uh, so many people have done this work for so long, and this perception that many young people have that we have to reinvent consistently these systems that have already um, kind of been created and then failed and are now being created again. And I, I, I just wanted to hear more yesterday from people in this room who've been through the cycles and who so patiently sit through these conversations for the 10th time. And so I just wanted to know if someone would share me, maybe it's you, Marty, like, what do you see we can do as a field to remember? Um, it's something also to what Crystal said, is that there were these people who inspired us to do this who are now gone. And I'm just wondering how we hold on to that knowledge moving forward, or is it okay for that knowledge to go away and for <coughs> us to have to paint by memory? <coughs> A, a, a quick thought just from listening to you is I always think things go better in twos and so if we buddied up and just found somebody that we wanted to hear <coughs> their stories and we wrote the damn article um, that person the buddy wrote it they got to interview the person they got to you know work in collaboration but so it got done but it wasn't yet another thing on the mounting on the pile but also be more fun because you get a relationship out right. of it so that's my thought. Cool. And I volunteer if you want to be my buddy, Nick. Uh, I, I, I volunteer. But actually, in terms of institutional person. memory, that's something that Bob Leonard and Ken did some years ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago, buddied up companies to do case studies of each other. Huh. And it, it, you know, it's in the can stuff, if you can find that stuff. So there's a perfect example of just what Nick was just asking right. about, is the fact that even that wonderful idea has been done. That doesn't mean it has to stop. It means it's got to keep going. Right. With an acknowledgement that that's that Bob made that happen. Mm. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's an, uh, just as a response to that, um, that there, there are Native American tribes in the Northwest that build longhouses. And the longhouses are built um, as a collective community process. And they uh, build them so that after 20 years, they, they, they uh, are no longer any good, so you have to build them again, which is the process of teaching the next generation how to do that process. Mm -hmm. So I think there is something to learn there in terms of thinking about how mm -hmm. we are redeveloping and, and recreating. And, and um, I think it's something about not thinking that it's brand new, but mm -hmm. also realizing that if we don't revisit it on a regular basis to try to reconstruct it, mm -hmm. that it, you know, that we're, we're, we are not just doing things over again, but we're making the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so how do, we, how do we learn that process? Mm -hmm. Oh, I just was again going to offer practically if 
if there's a desire for more documentation, we have, in a, you know, we have commons producers, people who are producing commons-based knowledge in um, 11 cities now that are actually working with us and forth, but we can almost always find someone who will do the buddying thing, and it's part of the issue, you're exactly right, Marty, which is, we, we talk to people all the time about trying to get their stories, and they're always like, oh, I don't have time, so well, how do we make that easy for you? So if you know that there are things that need documenting, you can email us and we'll figure out a way to get that done, you know, mm -hmm. to them, so. And right now, uh, my community is in the middle of doing this Elders Project, mm -hmm. and the Elders Project is really working on, um, you know, a lot of our, my elders are ready to go, you know, and so it's really sitting down, mm -hmm. and, especially in the theater world, you know. Uh, you know, even Ellen, you know, you know, people were having great conversations with Ellen at the end and how to continue that work. And um, it was really always the same thing. And I have to agree with Carl was saying, it's like, you know, it's rebuilding, you know, using that traditional method. Because elders really, re when I say elders, I mean, all of us have elders. We have our mentors, whatever. we have those people, you know, um, whatever background you come from. And the person who's gonna sit down and you say to them, so, you know, and just get into the conversation. Just get into the conversation, and they're willing to listen. I mean, they're willing to talk, you know, but you have to get to them before they hit a certain stage where they just care about, you know, they're going over to the other side. So, you know, there's a certain time, and what is an elder in a community? I think that needs to be, too, the difference between old people and elders, you know? <laughs> what is your elder? <laughs> you know, what is your elder? You know, we're, we're you know, to, a lot of us um, are trained very young, um, to be a good elder, to be a good ancestor, right? So I think that's important, and part of the Elders Project is taking those stories, whether it's theater, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, and taking that and documenting it somehow, some way, and either bringing a younger person than you, and we see a grand example of that at this theater, right? And, and we, see three gen we see two generations of women who brought their daughters and brought them up in this community, right? And then we see that happening. So to talk to the elders, and you have yourself, and then you have another person. So there's like three people there to document this. What about uh, going from documentation to mythologization? Because uh, at a certain point, this tension about language and communication uh, it's so important because it helps us become more sensitive. But at another time, I don't know if it serves the process of becoming more sensitive. I want to give a really specific experience I had with that, which is um, Auguste de Bois was a friend and mentor of mine. And, uh, and uh, he was very aware that in the latter years of his life, as much as he enjoyed the trappings of like guru moments, he was also very aware that there was a danger to his body of practice because some people were becoming slavishly orthodox about it. And he was very aware that if his story was written and he was mythologized, that his work may become frozen. Yeah. And that that would be a terrible thing, both for his legacy, which was, a, which was interested in evolution because he was really an artist, uh, but also just for the work being useful. So I know he, he would sort of reference that. And we had really interesting talks about that where he would just say, uh, the, the only, you know, I almost did my Gual accent and I won't. <laughs> um, he, uh, he would say, the, you know, the only way for, for a myth of me not to get in the way of the work of me was to destroy orthodoxy. Hmm. You know, so whatever was written, because he obviously wrote a lot of books and people wrote about him, he was just like, nobody can say, well, that's Boal, so that's the way it has to be done. And as soon as that's happening, that his work was dead. Yeah. Which, of course, you know, I just thought that was really interesting. And to me, that's a, what's a thought on that? It's a great question. I think one of the places I find this transition, uh, especially where I, when I think about my role in academia and what the role of academia is, is that this kind of research setting is supposedly, especially in a, I, I'm a, I teach a liberal arts college. So this type of discussion is supposed to instigate knowledge that changes the paradigm of education. That's what liberal arts is supposed to be, a gathering of information that then kind of shapes education and academia. Um, and I feel like where I find this transition now as kind of like a resource corridor is pushing this information that's that's real, that's real and not just stagnant into the pedagogy of people who need to read it and need to use it as a teaching tool mm. so that they don't become stuck in their own research as a production organization for themselves. Mm. I think that's where like, like artists get stuck in their own thing. Yeah. Academics get stuck in their own thing. And I think that that conversation is very important for both sides to grow. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
want, I wonder if that's like a good yeah. Yeah. wrap point. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe yeah. we just say thank you to everyone for the conversation. Thank <laughs> you.